right, you might have to. Hi, this is Dr. Brian Sohn. I'm here with Dr. Sarah Cooper. And uh, we're gonna talk today about Dr. Cooper's research and I'll let you start out, just introduce yourself and talk about where you're working and then maybe you can get into what you did for your dissertation. Sure, um, so my name is Sarah Cooper and I am a East Tennessee native and my school experience is a little interesting just based off of where I am right now. Um, I spent eight years in the elementary classroom teaching second grade and fifth grade, um, both departmentalized and self-contained. And then um, right smack dab in the middle of my dissertation and research journey, I took a job at a high school, um, totally went from the opposite side of the education spectrum for K-12. And uh, I'm now a high school assistant principal and I love it, absolutely love it. Um, it did make a lot of what we'll probably talk about today interesting um, and a little more difficult. Um, to get going, but I think now once once I've been involved in um, just the research process now, I see how beneficial it is to the work that I'm getting to currently do. And I think that's what makes it um, exciting for me. Yeah, so what was that research? Um, talk, to, talk to us, talk to the people who might watch this, whoever they may be. Sure, so when I started discovering, you know, kind of filing through what topics I wanted to research and what I was interested in. Uh, student relationships and relationship building was something that as an elementary teacher, I was just really invested in. And I, I saw the power of it and I saw um, the benefit of it. And I wanted my research to be kind of about that. And um, so I kind of took it from the opposite spectrum where I decided I was gonna look at those students that were chronically absent. Um, and what made them chronically absent um, in the elementary setting. So when I switched to high school, I also decided to go ahead and switch my research. And so I wanted to focus on chronically absent high school students and um, really wanted to figure out not just the students that were chronically absent that fit the typical mold of an individual who would be assumed to be um, missing a lot of school, but really looking at those that didn't fit the typical mold. Um, and what, what it was about their story and their journey that um, impacted them and, and, and made them be a chronically absent um, student in high school. So talk, talk a little bit about, if you will, it seems like um, it was really a piece of legislation, the Every School Succeeds Act, that kind of, in a way, pushed schools to focus on something like absenteeism. So in 2018, which was also the year that I got to take and do, um, I was part of an, an advocacy group. I got to take and do a year long advocacy group with an organization that helps educators understand how to just communicate with legislatures um, and, and really look at those stakeholders and, and learn how to talk to them. So while this was all going on, they also decided, the Tennessee Department of Ed decided that they were going to take in um, start holding schools and districts accountable for the number of students that were chronically absent. They actually put it on their state report cards um, and they did not exclude students who had um, underlying medical conditions or um, extenuating circumstances that before would have considered, um, would have been kind of removed from the formula or the equation. So everybody was included in it. And so a lot of schools really started paying attention to the number of students that were chronically absent um, because they were being held more accountable um, for that indicator. And so with, with that said, um, getting to take and be a part and listen to some of um, the sessions that this was all being discussed about and, and decided on, it made me realize that there was a big disconnect between hearing the term chronically absent and understanding what that actually looks like in a school and how it how you can turn um, it into, you know, how you can actually make action to help combat that chronic absenteeism. And I even hate to use the word combat because that seems so um, emotional, but at the same time, you know, just learning how to take and um, figure out a way as a school to build a foundation on something that supports those students instead of um, negatively impacts them. Mm -hmm. So, um... I guess some people might wonder, what does it mean for a kid to be chronically absent? So a, a chronically absent student um, is any student that misses um, 
about 18 days a school year, which translates to about two days a month, which when you think about it, um, that can often be overlooked because when you have a student in class every day uh, and they're missing a day here, a day there, two months, two days out of each month, in, in the moment that may not seem like a lot, but when you go back and look at it, you know, that's a significant chunk of a student's uh, learning. So, um, and you know, it may not be two days, maybe it's three or four and it's spread out one day a week or whatnot, but that just really can add up quickly without um, being very visible when you're looking at it in the moment. So in the, in the process of, of research, of course, you looked um, at a lot of different definitions of chronic absenteeism. And um, did you see like a, I'm just kind of drawing a connection. Well, Tennessee says we're gonna include everybody. And this number to me, it sounds like two days a month, 18 days for a school year doesn't really sound, like I, I wouldn't label that chronic necessarily unless it was regular whereas somebody right. missing a week all of a sudden they only get 11 more days and they're going to be labeled with this label so. uh you know i don't honestly remember if there was a specific percentage of a school year that that other states um identified uh as being chronically absent but everybody's um general term was a student who missed and they kept using the word significant and everybody uh -huh. kind of determined what significant was based off of, um, I think probably what they felt impacted their individual groups um, learning plan or learning path. Uh, but there was nobody ever seemed to agree on a specific number. It was just significant. So significant was never actually defined. Yeah, so now in your experience, um, maybe both at elementary and high school levels, plus with your research, what is the reason that states in Tennessee said, hey, we're gonna start keeping track of this in school, you're gonna be penalized if your number is super high or whatever they do. Well, a lot of it came down to funding. Um, how often a student is in school determines how much funding they receive. Um, a lot of it too also got tied back to test scores and academic achievement. And um, basically I think what they were trying to do from identifying a student is chronically absent is almost taking in and explaining away a student's lack of success. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this student was chronically absent. They were not in school for a significant number of days. Here is why they were not successful. Um, so it was almost as if it was an indicator to support a reason why a student wasn't um, succeeding in public schools. And do you think that that's uh, legitimate? Have you seen basically like, hey, if a kid misses a lot, their state test scores are usually bad. Is that what you yeah. think? Yes, and, and even more so now, uh, which, you know, I, I try really hard to not look at my research through a COVID lens because the pandemic has really changed a lot. Um, and I think students that would have normally not been considered chronically absent are now being considered chronically absent just because of just this new environment that we're in. So um, before this, I would say, yes, if you were someone who was not in school a lot, there were a couple of indicators. And, and a lot of the lit review that I did supported the fact that students who were the typical chronically absent student were students who missed a lot of school, who did not, um, did not see academic success. So they struggled academically in school, probably because of their significant number of days, especially in the lower elementary level. Um, and they were missing that foundational knowledge that they needed to build on. And once they got so far behind, if you will, it got harder for them to catch up, which also made them disinterested in school. Uh, and then the, that also led to, there were a lot of connections with, um, it led to behavior problems because they started to check out uh, and they were, they didn't want to be in school. And so they looked for ways to get out of it. Okay, so yeah, to me, that's that all very logical, right? Like if a student isn't there, they miss stuff. So then right. they come back and it's like, I don't know what's going on. And if a student doesn't know what's going on, they're way more likely to have behavior problems because I always tell students like there's no behavior in academics. They're just like, they're like this one thing. It's like, you can separate them, of course, but one leads to the other. So. Exactly. Okay. And I think that's what made, um, I remember having a conversation 
um, with Dr. Taylor very early on where he kind of planted the seed of that, well, what if you looked at the students that don't follow all of the things that the research is telling you? You know, you've read all of this. This is what makes a student, this is what impacts the student's uh, attendance in school. These are all of the reasons why by the time they get to high school, they're probably having very um, large number of days um, absent. And when you're in high school, it's a lot different than elementary and middle because you have multiple classes a day. Mm -hmm. So what actually, you know, like let's say you have four periods in a day um, and you miss 10 days, you actually miss 40 classes. And so you, we look at that 40, we don't look at the 10. Um, and so it just, it can build. And so, you know, now that I started taking kind of digging through the data that I had and looking at, these are students who, when I pull up their attendance, they have decent grades. They don't have any behavior log entries ever. Um, there was only one, I think, out of my all of my um, my case study group that had anything, and it was nothing that I would consider now um, something of concern in regards to uh, a behavior concern. Um, and they also had no underlying medical condi conditions like asthma or um, diabetes or anything that that seemed to take and kind of give students a reason to need to miss a lot of school. Um, these were kids that that truly did not fit the typical chronically absentee um, guidelines. Yeah, so talk about your case study and kind of this idea that you kind of picked out this group that wasn't typical. And so how did that fit in? So I did a narrative case study um, and I, I chose a narrative case study approach because I really wanted to um, tell the stories of individuals because I felt like since they didn't follow the typical path, there has to be something about their journey and their story that was different. Mm -hmm. um, and, and just meeting the students the first time, I realized how different their stories were gonna be. And I was really looking for, what is it about you and, and your life and your experiences that um, are, are impacting you in ways that most of us don't understand um, that obviously research up to this point is still trying to decide because whatever schools are incorporating, whatever guidelines they're putting in place, whatever policies or, or programs they're trying to implement, they're still missing you. So what is it about you that, that, is, um, that is different and that we need to know about? And so that's why I chose the narrative part of it because they did get the chance to share their stories. Um, and then the case study approach, that way I could follow a small group of students um, and, and really I'm still keeping up with these students now. That's why I picked freshmen. So um, I, I plan on, and again, <laughs> this was all before the world kind of fell apart. Um, but, you know, I, I think that it's gonna be even more important to pay attention to their stories now because what they're experiencing and what they shared in the case study um, and, and just their interviews and, and all the artifacts that I gathered from them is now almost typical to the average student this year. Mm -hmm. So um, it's been really interesting to kind of watch that unfold too. But um, that, you know, just I, I met with these students, I got to take and ask them questions and, and talk to them multiple times. I took surveys, uh, looked at their grades, looked at their, um, just their attendance all the way back to their first year of kindergarten, and um, really got to, got to just peel back layers <laughs> and and mm -hmm. what I found which I think I remember mentioning this in my defense was that the more layers I peeled back the more layers that presented themselves because everybody is so unique um but I think that by getting to work with the, these these kids I, I learned that um there are a lot of things that we as as a high school and really public education are missing and um it's been beneficial to me in my in my job as a, an as assistant principal Wow, you set me up really well for this one. So what are some of those things that you, you've learned that are better? That I've learned. So I was, so there were three major areas that um, just based off of what the students shared with me, I was able to kind of take and, and find those trends that showed up in all three of them. Um, the first big one was relationships, which I was already assuming were going to be there. Um, I just don't think I realized and this is probably lack of my experience in high school was that in the elementary world, you, you, you tend to take and lean on the fact that relationships are important and they're a lot easier to make connections. Um, you would assume with elementary students, they've kind of got those personalities that are a lot more open and a lot more willing, but the older they get, you kind of lose that a little bit, <laughs> a little bit, but that doesn't mean that students don't still need that. Um, a lot of the reasons that, um, 
the students that I followed in my case study struggled relationship wise with at school was they struggled with peer relationships. Um, they struggled with teacher relationships and um, they really, they, they didn't have anybody outside of school either to really support them. So it was just a lack of positive relationships in general. Um, but when there was a positive relationship present for them, that, that was the person or individual that they talked about. Um, you know, I like coming to school because my baseball coach checks in on me um, and my baseball coach is also my math my math teacher. And ironically enough, but again, also makes sense that that was the one class that that student attended more than any of his other classes. So um, same thing with one of the other students, she mentioned that her friends was, um, could be a reason why she didn't like to come to school, uh, but also on the flip side, when she had classes with friends, uh, she would come to those specific classes. And when they weren't in her classes, those were the ones she skipped or the days that she didn't choose to come. So. Um, I just, that was one I had hoped would be there, but also, um, you know, really felt that they gave a lot of insight as to the relationships component. Um, I was not expecting to uncover um, any sort of health. Uh, you know, one of my factors was there could not be, um, in order to qualify for this, you could not be an individual who had any sort of underlying medical conditions. And when I looked at that through the first lens, to me, that was like what I mentioned earlier, you know, asthma, diabetes, cancer, anything that would, um, I guess that would be more visual that would prevent you from coming to school, um, more recognizable, but almost all of the students mentioned um, struggling with mental health, which they, um, I, I, that was not on my radar at all, but that is something that we are dealing with in the high school world very much so now. Um, so it was a wake up call to me that we might not have the supports in place um, to help help those students work through those problems so that they can come to school. You know, they didn't want to get up and come to school because they had gone through X, Y, and Z. And those were things that we wouldn't see just looking at that student. Yeah, that's not showing up in their medical records, right? It's not showing up in their medical records. A lot of them are probably not receiving services um, outside of school. Um, so again, it wouldn't, it wouldn't show or flag on any of their files or any of the information, um, that we have. And, uh, so again, it, we would, we wouldn't know that without hearing about it from students. Um, and then the last thing that several of them mentioned was academic related, which I thought was interesting. Um, because again, that was something that I had said in order to be in the study, you couldn't have any academic challenges, but the students said by the time um, they got to their freshman year, this was their first experience in high school. There was more responsibility that was placed on their shoulders. Um, the content got a lot harder and they had a lot more classes, classes that they maybe had not been exposed to before. And so in the past where they could sneak by, um, they were learning that they could not necessarily do that as a freshman in high school. Um, so I, again, I wasn't expecting academics to show up, but it did in its own way. Uh -huh. So I'm hearing once again, that connection between behavior and academics. Mm -hmm. um, so with the pandemic, you mentioned that this kind of, these things that you found are now more widely applicable to a lot of students. Um, so what are you all doing? Uh, what are your plans as the administration, working with teachers, working with parents, what are you doing? So we are, the school, the high school that I work in at the moment has been, um, virtual and uh, in person. So we've been a hybrid from the very beginning. Um, we have students that kind of fluctuate back and forth between sometimes they're virtual and sometimes they're in person. And um, that's presented its own challenges. Plus a lot of the learning is going on through Google Classroom. Um, so it's a lot easier to lose students right now. And that's a scary thought for us. Um, we have um, our own alphabets that we take and follow, um, and we follow them for four years. So once they arrive in our alphabet, um, A through G is mine. Um, I follow those students for freshman through senior year. And so I think that helps us kind of narrow it down, but we also have over 1600 kids and that's still a lot of kids to keep up with. Mm -hmm. um, we just really, really, really ask our teachers to make sure that they are communicating with their students as much as possible. We're not focused so much on communicating with them, like getting that assignment turned in. It's more, hey, you haven't had your 
camera turned on or we've noticed that you've not responded in the chat box for a while, you know, is everything okay? It's just checking in on all students because they are struggling in so many ways that we just don't understand right now and that are so not visible to the normal individual um, that, it, like I said, I think a lot of it is just the relationship component and the following up. Um, we've also, because we know that supports are really important, we've tried to take in and um, ramp up how um, actively involved our counselors are. We have outside counselors that now come into our building and, and we see them more than what we would in a normal school year. So that way they're always on hand to take and set up Google Meets if need be, um, to take and schedule office hours with students because we just know that again, they're not going to norm, they're not gonna, most students are not gonna tell us that they're struggling in the normal way. So we feel like the more support that we can have available, hopefully the more that they'll feel comfortable reaching out. And then lastly, we're really trying to keep to the normal environment as much as possible. Um, you know, a lot of that's outside of our control. It's really what we're told we're allowed to have and what we're not, but we still do clubs. They just may be virtual. Um, our librarians are phenomenal. They're, you know, doing weekly book chats, trying to take and get kids to come into the library, trying to get books in their hands, regardless of if it means leaving it outside for somebody to pick up. Our art teachers are um, creating art supply bags so that these students can take and come pick things up and take them home. So we're just trying to help them find outlets that are ways that they can still stay involved with school amongst all of the other challenges and just trying to keep our eyes and our, um, keep everybody on our radar in, in a positive way. Yeah, that's that was hard for me, especially during the shutdown. Carson Newman in the fall went back to face-to-face -face classes with undergraduates. But in the fall, it seems like I would lose students and I would have to text them and call them and they would, they would for whatever they had going on, they were not participating in a normal way. Right. So yeah, it was, and, and I only have, you know, 80 students. So um, I can't imagine the, the, you know, when I was a high school teacher, I think I had a 160 average mm -hmm. um, every semester or so. Yeah, that'd be that'd be a lot. Well, uh, I think it's also um, a relationship factor, a, a responsibility factor. You know, the, these are students who are used to being in person all the time, so they're used to having that face-to-face, -face constant contact. And now that a lot of their learning is going on digitally, there is so much more opportunity for them to kind of um, just be in it unengaged and and to take a step away. And and it's hard for them to feel accountable when they never actually come into the school building. You know, it's all done through a device. And these are the individuals that have grown up in the digital world. So they are so much better at it <laughs> than we are. Um, and so there's just lots of, like I said, lots of different layers. But I do find it interesting that um, the struggles that a lot of these students that I followed last year before the pandemic are now more common throughout the throughout all of our student body. Um, and sadly, the students that I followed are also still chronically absent this year. Their just chronic absenteeism looks a lot different because they're virtual, um, yeah. all of them. Yeah, one thing you mentioned uh, briefly was the environment, and that, that figured into your dissertation. What, so what are some of the kind of environmental things aside from these relational supports that you're trying to encourage teachers to do uh, so, that you all have worked on? One of the questions that I, the, the, one of my three questions for my research was what impact does climate and culture play on student attendance? Um, and I think it's a really important discussion to have, again, with high school versus elementary, which was what I was used to is because I learned very quickly that um, the way I interacted in elementary, even with peers, um, is a lot different. High school teachers, and, and we joke about this now because they, things that I do, they're like, oh, that's so elementary. <laughs> but, um, you know, they, they are not as focused on the climate and culture. Um, and that's something that we as a staff um, and as an admin team have really tried to take in and pay attention to, even in um, the pandemic because it is, I think, now more important than it was before. Um, so just what, what is it that, that um, impacts the school's climate? What is it that alters the school's culture? Helping students and teachers understand the difference between climate and culture because I think those two words get used back and forth a lot without a true understanding of what it is. 
um, and what those um, what those two terms actually look like in education and what each of us can do to impact the climate and culture. Um, the students in the research um, in my in my case study talked about relationships between teachers and how teachers made them feel. Um, and that was a big one for them. If they were absent for a couple of days or if they were late to class for a couple of days, they were really worried about how that teacher was gonna respond to them. Um, you know, sometimes teachers would say things like, well, where have you been? You know, so glad that you came back to class. And for that teacher, it was probably a comment that they did not mean to intentionally impact that student in a negative way. For them, it was almost playful banter. But for that student who was already aware that they had missed school, now we're even more apprehensive. And that that potential conversation and, and that climate of the classroom actually would be what added to their missing days because they were avoiding that, um, which from last year to this year, that's something that we've asked our teachers to really be mindful of. You know, hey, we have a virtual student that is now gonna be back in person. Please just be like, hey, we're glad you're back or <laughs> not say anything, not like, oh, so nice of you to, so nice of you to join us again. So I think just being, being aware of how important, um, how important environment is when a student walks into the room, those are things they pick up on. And, and it's not just the teacher to the student, it's peer to peer as well. Um, you know, students are very perceptive. And so um, I, one of the comments that I remember in um, one of our interviews was a student said, you know, there are kids in my class who will make comments like, oh, do you just want to sleep in again today? When they didn't realize that that student had gone through, um, you know, potentially an emotional trauma the day before that they were trying to overcome. And they spent, you know, two hours that morning trying to get themselves to school mm -hmm. for a student to then say, oh, so nice of you to come this morning. Um, you know, again, what bringing it back to what can we as a school do to help everybody understand that that you impact the climate around you and that that climate then impacts the culture and atmosphere of a school. Yeah, but one of the things I'm trying to emphasize this year and uh, maybe we can get to where you kind of share some advice with future teachers, but one of the things we're emphasizing in my kind of intro class is this idea of unconditional love. And like a kid shows up, you just gotta be welcome, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so what, what is some advice based on what you know that you have for people who are um, going into teaching in their undergraduate program right now? Um, honestly, I think that one of the most important things that I learned um, when I first started teaching was to be mindful about the type of experiences that I create for the individuals in the classroom that I'm in. Um, and that still holds true now, you know, being aware that every single student in your classroom has a journey that you will probably never understand. And uh, you will never understand it because you're not living that specific, um, that specific uh, journey. <laughs> so um, empathy, I think is really big. And um, there's that phrase that everybody's using right now, grace upon grace upon grace. But I think it lends itself to understand that you as a teacher have a huge impact on how students feel once they get into your classroom. Um, whether you know that they've had something go on before they walked through that door, what's important for you as an educator is to understand that they get to start fresh the moment they walk through um, and that you are gonna hold them accountable because they are in charge and they are in control while they're with you. And, and that is something that you can help them with. But once they leave your door, Sometimes that's not always the case. I just, I think for new teachers, going back to the fact that you have to take and help students navigate through their learning experiences while understanding that there's so much going on under the surface that you're not going to be able to um, probably diagnose or recognize because you're teaching them, <laughs> you're, you're educating them. A lot of the other stuff is there and then it's just part of it. Well, yeah, that's good. That's good. Um, and I can pass that along, even for those that don't watch the video. Um, <laughs> uh, what do you, is there anything else that you'd like to add on your research or? Um, you know, honestly, I'm, we, we have spent a lot of time this year. Attendance is a daily conversation here. Um, our, our numbers of student attendance now um, are vastly different than what it was last year, just because of what we're going through. But um, 
I think that the further we move into this, the more that we are focused on how important attendance is. And so we're, we're not giving these students a lot of leeway. I mean, we, let's, what's the best way to say this? We are very understanding of what they're going through, but at the same time, we also know that this is going to be something that's going to impact them for, you know, decades down the road. And so, you know, we spend a lot of time on the phone talking to students. We are still having attendance meetings with families and students, you know, and our biggest thing is we see you, we know you are here, we know you are struggling, we know you are going through things, let us do what we can to help you, let us do our side of it, with the understanding that you have to take and give your side, you know, you have to take and put in some effort on your side too. Um, moving forward, I would love to see um, the conversation around students being in school and, and student attendance in regards to atmosphere and culture, environment, relationships, um, community partnerships, really building um, partnerships with those um, organizations out in the community that are there to take in and help our students be successful once they leave us. I think those are all things that we have a lot of room to grow in, but a positive of the pandemic is it's made us be more aware that this is definitely a problem. Mm -hmm. um, and so hopefully what we're putting in place now will be there and continue to get better down the road. And I'm going to continue following these students. I keep tracking these six students. I've got my eyes on them. And when they graduate, I would love to be able to do another set of interviews with them yeah. and if they can kind of compare their data. I mean, even if it's for us to use and share and, and just hear their perspective, because they're going to have something very unique that I didn't expect. They're going to get to take and explain going through um, a pandemic and and hopefully coming out on the other side of it with a lot of um, additional positive um, growth. Yeah, wow. Well, that's awesome. Yeah, thanks Thanks for sharing. Thanks for taking the time. And uh, that's great. 